Harry Mark Petrakis has been a major American writer for well over 50 years now. Since the first appearance of his first story in 1957, Pericles on 31st Street, uh, he has continued to see his work win all kinds of honors and awards for the span of those years. Uh, some of those awards include the Atlantic First Award, the O. Henry Prize, a two-time nomination for the National Book Award, uh, and many more. Most of us have been very happy to see uh, some of his more famous stories make it to the big screen with some uh, great directors uh, at the at the hands, Peter like people like excuse me like Peter Bogdanovich, uh, Daniel Mann, and uh, Sam Peckinpah, to name a few. Uh, he is a great friend of Moraine. He has been here uh, four times, I believe, already since 1998. Uh, recently, he has yet received another honor by the Newberry Library, who asked if they if he would consider Harry would consider. Uh, their establishment to uh, plant a permanent home for all of his manuscripts and letters. It is a great deal of pride and a, a tremendous amount of concern uh, that uh, he is with us today and concern in the good sense of the word. I am proud to say that he has been a close friend uh, for well over 25 years. Uh, please give a warm welcome to one of the best writers in American fiction, Mr. Harry Mark Petrakis. Good afternoon. Spencer is right. I've been here several times before. And each time I have to warn him about excessive, an excessive introduction. I have cautioned him that too much praise in a man's lifetime leaves nothing for his eulogy. <laughs> so it is important to exercise restraint. And I thought he did fairly well today. He did fairly well today. On the drive here today with my friend Peter from Indiana, I wondered what it was I should speak of today. And you say, well, there have to be a certain number of things you, you speak of, but I've been talking now for 50 years. And 50 years may sound like two words, but 50 years of lecturing and writing give you a sense, first of all, how old I am. And then that constitutes hundreds of trips back and forth across the United States. And in the beginning, when the fees were small, the lecture bureau that sent me out on the road would have to make it worthwhile. So they'd send me out for 10 days, and in those 10 days I might do six colleges, traveling from one college town at night to another. And that means arriving in some bleak bus depot or shabby railroad station or commuter airport to be met by an associate instructor in the English department, taken to the only hotel or motel in town. In those days before the Ramadas and the Hiltons and the Holiday Inns, all of these places seem to me to bear names like the sections of cemeteries, Sleepy Hollow and Shady Rest. <laughs> Into the lobby which smelled as musty as a mausoleum, always a rustic asleep in the corner. You could never be sure whether he was asleep or dead. Then up to my room in an elevator that creaked as it ascended walking a hallway over a rug that had sustained the tread of hopeless men and women. I would sleep that night in a bed on a mattress that smelled of sin, semen, and futility. All at very reasonable rates. 
and in the morning would rise to shave before a vanity mirror that was always cracked. So twisting my face to meet the contortions of the glass accentuated the schizophrenic aspects of my nature and turned my thoughts to self-destruction. Then on to what was the pleasantest part of the day, the meeting with students, that age-old effort to communicate meaningfully with other human beings. And then, after a small reception afterwards, and perhaps a luncheon with some faculty members, several of them thinking they wrote much better than I did, why couldn't they get their books published? Then on to the next college town. But there were always lessons to be learned, observations to be absorbed, even in the introductions, even in the meetings with the various people, the deans, the faculty, so many students. There was a woman in a woman's club in Minnesota who introduced me as Mr. Petrakis, the world-renowned author of Zorba the Greek. <laughs> she was enthusiastic but inaccurate. As those of you who have read him know, Zorba was written by an eminently greater author who I count my master and mentor. What we share is that we both come, our families come from the island of Crete, the most beautiful of the Greek islands. There are other lessons, as I say, to be absorbed. I remember getting into some small college town not only can I not remember the college, I can't remember the state, except it was somewhere in the south. I was picked up in this instance by the dean of the college, who was also an ordained Baptist minister. And we drove from, for some miles through the dark southern countryside, spoke of the college, which was a small liberal arts school. The enrollment, I think, was 500, 600. I said, Dean, how many do you expect will be at the convocation in the morning? He said, well, it's not compulsory. Based on past experience, I would anticipate 30 to 40. Well, I was young and very arrogant then. And I said, Dean, forgive me. That hardly seems an adequate number. And we drove in silence for a few more miles. And then the dean of the college who was, remember, an ordained Baptist minister, spoke to me in a grave, reproving voice. He said, Mr. Petrakis, the Master Jesus Christ spoke to only twelve. I've never been able to complain about the size of any audience since then, <laughs> as long as there are more than twelve. The other thing I felt driving here today is you look at this ancient man and you say, well, you don't look quite that ancient, but I am now 85 years old. And all I can say to you is that nothing in youth prepares you for old age. That comes as a stunning surprise, little by little. And yet you accept it gratefully because the alternative is not acceptable, that you don't reach old age. But you have a right as students to expect that a man who has lived this long and written his books and met and spoken to so many people would have something useful, something beyond simple entertainment or performance to pass on to you. And it is difficult to know just what that is. One can hope that in the speaking, in the communication, that some veracity, some small elemental truth is communicated. I don't want to simply lecture to you today. I want to be able to keep the last part of our session together for questions. If you cannot have Mark Twain or Dostoevsky here today, you must do with Petrakis. 
and I will make whatever effort I can to respond to those, to those questions. So many things to tell, so many aspects of life, so many fragments of experience. Perhaps it might be entertaining and informative to go back to the beginning, a story, an immigrant story, not unlike that I'm sure that many of your grandparents experienced. My father was a Greek Orthodox priest. In our church, priests are permitted to marry as long as they do it before ordainment. He had my wife, my mother, called in Greek a presbytera, and four children. And he immigrated to this country in 1916 with that family. Then two more of us were born here. Now, at that time, thousands of young Cretans had been brought across literally as indentured servants to work the coal mines of Colorado and Utah. They came over without families, without wives, sisters, sweethearts. Their link to the old country was the church. And the young men in this mining community of Price built a church but had no priest but a circuit-riding priest who would come by once a month. So they petitioned the bishop in Crete to send them a priest, but they yearned and longed for the sight of a Cretan family, a Cretan mother, a Cretan children, Cretan children. And the bishop went to my father, but it was 1916, the war was on in Europe, there were the children to consider. My father and mother declined. The young men kept writing, the bishop kept petitioning. Twice more, my parents said no. And then the fourth time, the young men imploring the bishop to send them a priest. They decided to make the journey. My father told us later he knew America would provide greater educational opportunities for his children. They made the trip, the hazardous trip, from Europe to New York were met there by a man from the parish in Price, Utah, took the train west to Salt Lake City, the transportation hub. From there they would go by car to Price, about 40 miles away. Now, unbeknownst to them, when they arrived in the depot in Salt Lake City, a thousand young miners had gathered from a hundred miles around to greet the new priest and his family. This was the West. They wore guns, and to celebrate, they fired the guns off into the air. And so when they first entered the station, my mother told us years later, she thought they had entered a war zone. <laughs> Hundreds of guns being fired into the air, a clamor, a thunder. <clears throat> it wasn't until my mother descended from the train, my two sisters dressed in white lace dresses beside her, and they walked through the crowd that a silence fell over the assembled men. And my mother told us that men made their cross in gratitude, and some wept, and some knelt and prayed in thankfulness. And some, my mother said, kissed the hem of her dress as she passed. So grateful were they for the sight of a Cretan mother and Cretan children. From Price, my family moved to Savannah, Georgia, to St. Louis, where I was born. And that same year, I was less than six months old, to Chicago, to a parish on the south side of Chicago, the inner city. And it is here that my memories begin, because this is where, this is where I grew up. Six children in the family the period of the Depression. Politicians, speaking of it now, refer to this cataclysm we're undertaking now as, as large and calamitous as the Great Depression. Well, it was a serious business. We never went hungry, but there was a lot of bartering going on with parishioners who couldn't put much into the tray at church 
bringing chickens and fruit and vegetables to our family. I remember we lived, for those of you who know something of the inner city, we lived in a succession of old three-story and two-story apartment buildings. All of them, it seemed to me, designed by the same brooding architects whose avowed intention was to eliminate as much light and warmth from the rooms as possible. I could never understand why every bedroom window had to look out on the brick wall of the building next door. The layout was the same. Sun parlor room in front, living room, long, narrow hallway from which bedrooms and bathrooms ran off like cubicles in the labyrinth of Daedalus. Dining room, kitchen, Back of the kitchen, like the pouch on a kangaroo, a small room full of windows, and therefore the only part of the apartment suffused with light. This room, because I was one of the youngest, was my domain, a tiny room, but full of light. Unfortunately, the windows were old and never fully closed, so in winter this room was a refrigerator or as we had in those days, an ice box. And I can remember waking on a early morning, testing the temperature of the air to test its, its frigidity, and then huddling back under the covers until my mother made me rise. Now, when I exhaled, you might say, I might ask you, what did I see? And you would naturally reply, you saw your breath. But ah, now here we must begin with a truism, an understanding. To the writer, there is no such thing as ordinary experience. Every life is extraordinary. It does not matter how many have loved before us. When we love, love is born on the earth as if for the first time. And we experience anew the words of Margaret Mead when she spoke of the world of the first rose and the first lark song. So I would have to reply to your reply, no, I did not see my breath. I saw the sphere of my exhalation congeal into a glacier and plummet to the floor. But this room was a delight in spring and summer. I could open the windows. The alleys were our playground, my friends would call. We'd descend to the alleys. We played the games. I think some of you may still play. If not, your parents played. Hide-go-seek, run, chief, run. A great favorite, kick the can. Remember kick the can, the goalkeeper tending the can, spotting a player, tapping the can, the player coming to jail. The danger for the goalkeeper was that if even one player remained free, who might get to the can and kick it before the goalkeeper could call his name, then those already captured would scatter to their freedom. I remember one magnificent game of kick the can. Nineteen of my playmates captured. I was the only one still free. How did I know I was the only one still free? I could hear their plaintive, beseeching voices calling to me across the backyard fences. Harry, save us. You're our only chance. Harry. I crept stealthily from yard to yard, shinnied up a telephone pole, which I could do in those days, crouched on the garage roof. There they were in the alley below me, my 19 captured companions and the nervous goalkeeper. He looked to the right. He looked to the left but he never thought of looking up. There I was, perched on the roof. I stood up in that moment, in that quivering escarpment, and in that instant I was not raggy, trousered, sneaker-prone Harry. I was Achilles storming the ramparts of Troy. I leaped down into their startled mist and gave the can a smashing, furious kick that sent it rolling and ricocheting down the alley. Nineteen of my playmates cried out my name in jubilation and scattered to their freedom. 
the goalkeeper, a good friend of mine until that day, <laughs> was in such despair he sat down on the stone of the alley and cried. Ah, you say now, come, Patrakis, no matter how you ornament it, wasn't it, after all, only a game of kick the can? If it were only a game of kick the can, why do I remember it so vividly after more than 65 years? It was for me a moment, an unmatched moment of garlanded triumph I have been trying vainly in my life to match ever since. Twilight and the voices of the mothers calling across the gathering darkness. And now we descend to our kitchens, into our own ethnic preserves, the scents, the aromas, the taste of different ethnic foods. For me, my mother's kitchen in memory is always warm with the sense of freshly baked bread. You might ask, was she always baking? No, she probably didn't bake more than once a month. But you will find it true as you grow older that certain memories return with a special clarity and they may be simplified, not as complex as they were when they were befalling you. And so for me, my mother's kitchen will always smell of the scents of warm bread. And my sister and I would have a piece of it sometimes with what was a delicacy then and must be repulsive to you now. Marrow from the great soup bones the mothers then boiled for broth before the days of canned broths. Whenever I say a marrow sandwich to young people like yourselves, I always see on a few faces a sense of revulsion. And I can only say you've been deprived. You don't know what a delicacy a marrow sandwich was. Now, this was the 1930s. We attended the parochial school. Part of the day's curriculum in English, a couple of hours a day in Greek to maintain that link to the old country. This was also a different period in that an important part of the curriculum at that time in the schools were the beatings. Now, the American teachers beat us as a matter of contractual obligation <laughs> without any real fervor. But the Greek teachers, true to their passionate Mediterranean background, beat us with dedication and devotion. Now, of all of them who beat us, None did it with more ardor and fervor than a man who was principal for a while in our school. I will not give you his full name. There may be a distant relative here today. We called him. I will give it to you in Greek first and then translate it. But you must hear the harshness of it in Greek to properly appreciate the sound. We called him Okirios Arios. <laughs> Translated, that means Mr. Beast. And he was indeed a beast, like a gorgon, a medusa. He prowled the corridors in the schoolyard. He seemed to have an, a particular affinity for me, and I suffered the cursed tick for the most trivial infraction. I remember once trying to get past the open door of his office. I couldn't hear him. I couldn't see him. I knew he was there. You might ask, if I couldn't see him and I couldn't hear him, how could I know he was there? Well, if one goes to the zoo when you're still a mile away from the cage of lions, is there not a fetid stench riding the air? I could smell his presence. I tried to slip by. He spotted me, called my name, Hedy. I walked in. He came from behind the desk, the stick in his hand. We swore he sl slept with it. He put his face close to mine. I could smell the garlic on his breath. He said to me, What evil have you done today? Now, it was very early in the morning. 
I had not yet had time to commit any mischief, any misdemeanor. Secure in my innocence, I said, nothing, absolutely nothing. Up the stick, cracked me across the right leg. Up the stick, he cracked me across the left leg. The pain was ferocious. But worse than the pain, my indignation. I had done nothing. Why should I be punished? And then, with the implacable logic of the beast, he said, That is for the evil you will do tomorrow. <laughs> and he was right. By the next day I had committed some indiscretion. Mr. Beast was our teacher of Greek history and Greek religion. And in both, he was a fundamentalist. He would spend a good portion of the religion classes speaking to us in graphic detail of the horrors of hell which he said we were all destined to experience. He'd say, Petrakis, you are going to hell and you'll find all your friends waiting for you there. His view of Greek history was just as fundamental. Our ancestors were heroic poets, warriors, dramatists. We were cockroaches, worms, who would spend our lives vainly trying to ascend those Olympian heights. Once I tried. In the seventh grade class of that parochial school, in my seat in the rear row, trying to keep as far away from the teacher as I could, I had forgotten my lunch. A simple oversight. I had forgotten the small bag with my lunch in the dining room at home. We went through morning classes. Lunchtime came. The teacher, noticing I had no lunch, asked me where it was. Now, the simplest response would have been, I forgot it at home. No great punishment for that. But perhaps I had echoing in my ears the admonitions of Mr. Beast to aspire to greatness. And somehow having to utter so commonplace and ordinary a statement as, I forgot it at home, seemed insufferable to me. And on the spot, my imagination took flight like a gull. And I concocted a story which went something like this. So on my way to school this morning, I saw a ragged old man sitting in the gutter. I paused and asked him what was wrong. He said he was very hungry because he had not eaten in three days. I realized then the only Christian and humane thing for me to do, particularly since my father's the priest, <laughs> was to give the poor old man my lunch, which I did. I had told that small sneaky lie to impress my teacher, and she was impressed beyond my wildest expectations. She had great brown eyes, and in that moment they swelled open to resemble great bursting cups. She sent one of my classmates for the principal, for Mr. Beast. And when he came into our classroom, she called the class to attention. She said, Class, you've all heard Harry read his good little stories to us before. But today he has a true experience to share with us. I want you to listen to it carefully and take it as a model, as an example for the way you should try to live in your own lives. And she turned to me, her voice softened, and she said, Harry, repeat that marvelous experience again. <laughs> now I have told a small sneaky lie, a quick furtive lie to impress my teacher. But suddenly, with the whole class watching me, with in the front row a bare-legged, raven-haired beauty named Olga, the loveliest girl in all the school. Olga 
was beloved by every boy in that school. I loved her too. She had never given the slightest indication she knew I was alive. Suddenly Olga was watching me. Olga was waiting for what I had to say. I could not repeat that small, sneaky lie again. I had to make it a big, juicy, Homeric lie. <laughs> and now I spoke of the scuffed and shabby tips of the old man's shoes. I spoke of his trousers that looked as if they'd been patched and mended many times. I spoke of the way his fingers quivered with weakness from hunger when he took the bag of lunch from my hands. I spoke of the way his voice quavered at the end when he thanked me, saying, God bless you, my son. I did it so powerfully, so dramatically. I wish I could carry you back over the decades to that classroom with me to have seen my performance. I mean, if an Academy Award could be given for lying, I would have won hands down. In the end... For the first time, Mr. Beast touched me without the stick, tapping my shoulder in approbation and uttering two words I will never forget. Good boy. Olga, the exquisite Olga, had two great limpid tears running down her exquisite cheeks. And the class... The class was so awed at what I had done, they neglected to applaud, which would have been an understandable reaction for so meritorious a gesture. Now I walked with my head bent in the seemly, although hypocritical, demeanor of modesty to my seat in the rear row, and before I reached it, it was visited by a swarm of my classmates who brought me halves of their own lunches. So when I got to my desk, it was piled high with halves of bologna, salami, and cheese sandwiches, Lorna Doon and chocolate chip cookies, apples, oranges, bananas, enough to fill a fruit stand. And yes, from Olga, who left her seat in the first row and came walking with the grace of a Homeric princess to my seat in the rear row and with her own slender, delicate fingers laid upon my desk like a votive offering, one golden, juice-glutted peach. Come back with me now to that classroom. See me in that moment of my bloated, deceptive triumph taking a bite from half a bologna sandwich, putting it down, responding to a friend on the right calling me, Harry, Harry, I say, yeah. Hey, Harry, how did you ever think to do such a thing? I said, I don't know. Something just came over me, I guess. A friend on the left, Harry, Harry, I say, yeah. He said, you know, you'll be number one in the school from now on. I say, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> when suddenly, at the pinnacle of my triumph, at the moment of my hypocritical glory, the door of my classroom opened. It was my mother. <laughs> uh, she was my mother, and I loved her. And for one unbalanced moment, I was even glad to see her. Hi, Mama. <laughs> it wasn't until she entered the room. It wasn't until my teacher, who knew her, of course, rose to greet her. It wasn't until I saw my mother hand the teacher the small brown bag with my lunch. It wasn't until that moment I would have my first experience of what 60 years later I would hear Zorba say when he spoke of the whole catastrophe. 
Now you're a good audience, a receptive one. You could be doing other things than sitting here listening to me today. I would like to be able to tell you exactly what transpired then, what my mother said, what the teacher said, what the principal did. I cannot. The experience was so horrible and traumatic, I have blotted it completely from my mind. One thing I do remember, how Olga left her seat in the first row and came walking with the grace of a Homeric princess to my seat in the rear row. And with her own slender, delicate fingers, reached down to my desk and took back her peach. <laughs> now I've lived a long time and I have known many humiliations, but nothing to match the mortification of that moment. Memories, painful memories, memories of love and of sorrow, all of those are the raw materials the writer draws upon as each of us as human beings, whether we write or not, draw upon. And the truth, full of irony, is that the memories alter as we grow older. So the same memory we might recall changes as we change. Some burn with a particular light, a particular glow but in the prism of our own lives alter in shadow and in dimension. They are the raw materials for the writer. We draw upon that which we have experienced with that which we know. The experience of one death teaches us something of all deaths. The experience of one sorrow or one love opens a world of understanding for us regards sorrow and love. What is another element the writer draws upon to create his stories? It is simply an awareness that because we are human, we are flawed creatures. But the flaws can often bear their own validity. Society condemns the prostitute, the harlot, the wanton woman. But might there not be times when the wanton woman could be a friend to loneliness and desolation in the night? Society condemns the fool. What good is a fool? But the fool may be able to overcome the suspicion of wiser men and women and give food to someone who is genuinely hungry. Society mocks the coward. What good is the coward? The exact opposite of what we have come to respect in the John Wayne and Clint Eastwood movie. But the coward knows what it is to be frightened and therefore may be able to comfort others who are in terror. And above all else, compassion, an understanding of how frail we truly are. We have our moment on earth which seems to us a lifetime and yet in the long span of eternity is no more than the flutter of a moth's wing. We are engaged in this great adventure together. Each life individual but all of us destined to end the same way in the embrace of, of death. You say, well, the, the thing to remember is that there is no guarantee that one will live to grow old. The moment we are born, we are old enough to die. And we live, each of us, with that uncertainty. We live, each of us, with that awareness. And with an understanding that beyond our ethnic and racial divisions, 
there are those human dimensions which link us all to life and to death. The journey which begins with birth may end at any time. So on that level, if you identify with what I'm saying, then I can look out as I often have on an audience of young people and not merely see an assemblage of faces. I see that among you will be many I will not get to speak to. Your only contact with me will be this brief time we've spent together. And yet I know that some of you are destined to live lives as long as mine and perhaps longer, to breed many children, to travel across the world. And there are others who will lead relatively shorter lives, will not experience all the dimensions of experience. There are those even now by the law of averages, those few among you who have already the seeds of some illness within you that will kill you within a few years. Now, I don't say that to make the afternoon gloomy or to make you think that I dwell constantly on these things. Although the truth is, as I grow older, I do think more and more often of death. But to bring to you an awareness of that vision and that compassion for humanity, the writer must have, if he is going to enter the character of men and women and write of them in a moving and profound and profound way. I said I was going to try to avoid lecturing to you. I don't think it's been as much a lecture as storytelling. And maybe that's because that is how I regard myself as a storyteller and what meaning people find in my work is fine but those are not always meanings that I have intended to put into them Faulkner once speaking at some university was confronted by a bright young student who said Mr. Faulkner in your story a rose for Emily I see the meaning, the significance, the symbolism of the rose being this and that and this and that. And Faulkner, who had his pipe in his mouth, took it out and said, You saw all that in my story. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So you read the stories and find in them what you want. I am a storyteller, and I try to make my stories entertaining and yet at the same time reveal something of the frailty and the strength and the capacity for love and endurance that constitute every human being, every life. Now I will stop lecturing and storytelling and let you go to some questions that I will endeavor to I will endeavor to answer about some aspect of writing when I was I have never taught for an extended period of time as Mr. Farman's and some of the others the other teachers here but I've been in residency you know for brief periods and uh, I'd have these counseling sessions with students supposedly over their work but we find ourselves talking of thwarted love affairs and, and unhappy parent-son and parent-daughter relationships. And, and they look at you almost as if, well, you've lived as long as you've lived. If you're not a total idiot, you've got to have learned a few lessons. Can't you pass some fragment of that on to me? I mean, you have every right to expect something from me that is meaningful. Well, all I can say in response is that age does not necessarily guarantee wisdom. You can be an old fool as easily as you can be a young fool. 
I know in many ways I am an old fool and you are younger fools and in the end you will have caught up <laughs> all right let's take a little time for some some questions whether my own work the work of other writers I may or may not know to whatever degree possible there's so many areas we could have covered today the technique of writing how a writer writes his stories so many other things and yet um, less and less as I speak now knowing that I'm in the, the the twilight of my speaking engagements I'm less and less concerned with passing on aspects of technique and style you can get that from your instructors in your classes I want to be able to tell a story that you will remember and recall afterwards and if you leave today simply with an, an awareness reawakened in you that the story can still have the beauty and vitality and charm that it had for you as children and that your children will have then the afternoon will not have been a total failure. Okay, who wants to start? Yes. What effect have Cousin Zygis' writings had on me? Well, I don't know how many of you know his work. His most famous, of course, is Zorba the Greek, and he did the Greek passion, freedom or death. Uh, but he was a giant. He was a giant of, of modern Greek literature and modern world history. And he came, as I say, from the island of Crete. And I had to read him. I don't read Greek, although I speak it. I don't read Greek well enough to be able to read him in the original Greek. And my mother said to me, you'll never really understand Cousin Zykes unless you read him in Greek. I haven't been able to read him in Greek, but I have appreciated him in English. And he provided me eyes and a soul to understand Greece, to understand that small, lovely country and the island from which my parents came and that I didn't see until I was in my 30s for the first time. But strangely, when I went back and saw it, why, it was as if I had come home. In some way, I had come to ground that belonged to us. So Cousin Zykes lived and wrote many books that have been translated into 50 languages. So if you leave here today and don't get to read any more Petrakis than you've already read, that's fine. I absolve you of any guilt. But read Cousin Zykes. He is so rich and so multi-layered in his meanings and in the beauty of his expression, even in translation. When he first died, the church in Greece, thinking because he had been through the spectrum of experience, he followed Buddha and he followed Marx and he followed Lenin and he followed Nietzsche. And so they called him an atheist and a communist and a disbeliever. And the church at first refused him burial. And then the Bishop of Crete ordained that he be brought. And they had a magnificent funeral for him in Crete. And school children were given a holiday and each one carried one of his 50 different books in their hands. And then they buried him like a pagan king on a great wall overlooking the city of Heraklion. And there is no name, no date of birth, no date of death on his grave. A simple wooden cross, such as the ancient Christians might have carried in the catacombs. And on it in Greek, the words, I fear nothing, I hope for nothing, I am free. And the day I was there, there were a cluster of young students from Asia who had brought his books in translation and sat by his grave reading from the work. So, a tremendous, tremendous writer, 
my latest book, which is a sequel to an earlier novel on the Greek War of Independence, I dedicated to Cousin Sakis. I had never known him. I did get to know his wife over a period of years, who died just a couple of years ago at the age of a hundred and is buried on that bastion wall beside him. I don't mean to make all my answers as uh, long as that, but uh, yes. Well, most of my books have been contemporary. I mean, over the last 40, 50 years. The Hour of the Bell was my venture into the Greek War of Independence. And it's a war very few people know about, and even many Greeks know inaccurately. They don't know, for instance, that in 1453, Greece, parts of it at a time, became enslaved to the Ottoman Turks. And they remained enslaved for 400 years. Stop and think 400 years. Children born into bondage, growing up, becoming old men and old women and dying still slaves. Generation after generation, until there must have been a feeling amongst them that their nation, their land had never been free. So there were aborted revolts that were put down by the Ottomans with great cruelty. And then in 1821, one of these revolts broke out that despite many frustrations, which would make another whole lecture, despite disappointments, despite two terrible civil wars which reflect poorly on the Greeks, when there was an external enemy, they fought it. When there was no external enemy, they fought each other. That is the Greek way. I mean, that is what they do. But somehow or other, they managed to achieve, at least for most of Greece, its freedom. Now, I say to somebody, the Greek War of Independence. They now, oh, oh, yes, the Greek War of Independence. You know, that was following 400 years of slavery. Oh, oh yes, yes, following 400 years. Of... I said, that was the war where the English poet Alfred Lord Byron went and died in the Greek cause. Oh, Byron, I know Byron. Yeah, I know Byron. But anyway, Cousin Zykes had not written of it. He had written because at the end, it's hard I tried to make these. My, if my wife were in the audience, she'd say, you're ta taking too long to answer the question. But Cousin Zykes had written when most of Greece was liberated, the great powers, not wanting to weaken Turkey so much that the Russian Tsar would become too powerful. You see, even then, power politics were at play. They allowed the Turks to retain certain portions of Greece. And among these was the island of Crete. So my father and mother's island remained enslaved for an additional 85 years. So every 15 or 20 years, the Cretans would rise in an abortive revolt that was lost, and they'd lose the cream of their young manhood in these abortive revolts. Because like had written of one of these revolts, but he had not touched the Greek War of Independence. And so I took, it as my, I took it as my province, researched for several years, made a couple of trips to Greece, followed the journeys to various battlegrounds, and came back and wrote a novel that I planned as part of a trilogy. It was called The Hour of the Bell. And it took me not to write a trilogy, but to write the second novel 
30 years. And so that is my most recent book, and it's called The Shepherds of Shadows. And it is the story of the struggle for liberation, but above all else, again, it is a story. I think a good story. Yes? Well, I think it's simply true that whether they realize it, the men realize it or not, the women are often triumphant and stronger. I'm glad to hear you say that because I've had women tell me that I don't understand women and the women in my stories are not real, authentic characters. So, you know, I have great respect for women, I understand, I think, something of their strength. Sometimes it's difficult for a writer. They don't do women well. They, they see the world through a prism of masculine eyes. But that suggests that we are either clearly feminine or masculine, and that's nonsense, because we are, as I say, a whole undulating fissure of, of both so that we have those characteristics within us that one, one says, well, men are not supposed to cry, women have more compassion, nonsense. Men can feel the same anguish. They may not wish to cry in front of others, but uh, I confess I'm Greek in heritage. I cry often. The older I become, the more easily I cry. And that has something to do with it. I try to be, I try to be fair. In my stories, I write sometimes of the triumph. There's a story of mine, and I wish we had time today, but a story of mine in the collected stories called Journal of a Wife Beater. And I have read it probably before college audiences 200, 300 times, literally because it's a marvelous story in revealing facets of the male and female nature. This is an old country Greek, which means, you know, he thinks men are by nature superior. In the old country, his father used to clout his mother occasionally, and she seemed a happy, serene woman. So this guy finally in the United States gets married, but he marries a young, strong, emancipated Greek girl. And the first time he decides, casually, because she's been a little lax in some of her duties as he sees them, first time he decides to clout her, she hits him back. And he, in the beginning, is outraged at this. How dare she raise her hand to him? So he hits her a second time. And this time, in the middle of the night, she comes into the room and with a skillet, she lands it on his head. And you know, he... He can't believe this. He goes to his parish priest, and they consult, and the priest is horrified. The old priest, who is very much old countryish too, this particular priest, he said, if you came to me with a problem of drunkenness or infidelity, I have some experience in these areas. But a wife who dares attack her husband, I must go to the bishop. I must consult the bishop. And Vasily Makris, this insufferably narrow-minded man, thinks, what an indignation, what an outrage, forcing my parish priest to go to the bishop. The only thing for me to do will be to give her a beating she will never forget. She won't be able to raise her hand in response. So, one evening in the restaurant, he waits until she has completed all the work. And then he rises and he hits her. Quick as a flash, she strikes him back. Now, 
he realizes she's testing his mettle, and he hits her harder. She hits him harder back. Then, with full masculine fury, he lands a tremendous blow upon her. Now I read you the very last entry, because all this he has been recording in his journal, supposedly the message of an ideal relationship. But this is the final entry in his journal. Let me find it. My God, it doesn't seem to be in this. It has to be in this story. Oh, right, right at the beginning. I'm sorry. This is the final entry in the journal. After that horrendous experience in the restaurant. October 23rd. In the life of every noble man, there are moments of decisive discovery and events of inspired revelation. I hasten with fire and zeal to record such an experience in this journal. That epic night when Nietzsche came to the kitchen of the restaurant after finishing her work, without a word of explanation, I struck her. Quick as a flash, she struck me back. I was prepared for that and hit her harder. She replied with a thump on my head that staggered me. I threw all hesitations to the winds and landed a fierce blow upon her. Instead of submitting as she should have done, she became a flame of baleful fury. She twisted violently in search of some weapon to implement her rage and scooped up a meat cleaver off the block. I let out a hoarse shout of panic and turned desperately and fled. I heard her pounding like a maddened mare after me, and I made the door leading to the alley and bounded out with a wild cry. I forgot completely the accursed stairs and spun like a top in the air and landed in the stone of the alley on my head. I woke in the hospital where I am at present. And I'm pleased to report the x-rays have indicated no damage beyond a possible concussion that still causes me some dizziness. At the first opportunity, I examined myself secretly for reassurance that some vital part of me had not been dismembered by that frightful cleaver. Then I sat and recollected each detail of that experience with somber horror. A blow, now and then, delivered in good humor and good faith, is one of the prerogatives of marriage. Malevolent assault and savage butchery are quite another matter. However, as my first sense of appalled outrage and angry resentment passed, I found the entire situation developing conclusive compensations. I had fancied myself married to a mortal woman and instead was united to a goddess, a fierce Diana, a cyclonic Juno. I realized with a shock of recognition that one eagle had found another, perched on Olympian peaks, high above the obscure valley of pigeons and sheep. Oh, fortunate woman! You have gained my mercy and forbearance and have proven to my satisfaction that you deserve my virile love and are worthy of my intrepid manhood. Nietzsche, rejoice. You need no longer tremble or fear that I will ever strike you again. You know well the reason the poor fool thinks that is because he knows if he touches her again, she'll kill him. <laughs> All right, Spencer, thank you so much.